Welcome to Promote Profit Publish. I'm your host, Juliette Clark. And today we're actually starting to interview so you guys can get to know the 2025 magazine, Breakthrough Author Magazine contributors. And today's guest is one of the first ones that we're going to be interviewing. So really excited about that. And you're going to love him. Yes, we got some more men in the magazine. I know everybody's been complaining that it's kind of woman heavy. But um, so, yes, I'm really excited about this. But before we get started, I want to share with you on uh, in November, the first Friday of November, we are hosting a training event. It's going to be a little bit longer than most. It'll be about 90 minutes this time. And I'm actually going to take last year's course, Platform Planning Palooza. And I'm going to train you guys on it for free on the training. I know a lot of coaches, authors, speakers out there are struggling a little bit uh, monetarily right now. So um, I wanted to offer that for free. Um, we will be providing the forms, the workbook, and we'll go through it just right on camera so you can understand how to put all of your 2025 desires and tensions together and actually break them down into smaller pieces so you can get it done. So you can register over at platformplanning.com. That's platformplanning.com. And again, it is a free event. So, um, you know, no worries about money and we'll help you get that done. So today's guest is Anthony Jones, and he is a LinkedIn growth consultant with a deep background in personal branding and digital marketing. Over two decades, he spearheaded a team at Ducks Unlimited, directing online fundraising efforts that totaled over $40 million. Now he runs his own consulting firm, and Anthony dedicates his expertise to helping professionals and organizations harness the power of LinkedIn. His strategies focus on building personal brands and crafting impactful content that boosts visibility, attracts leads and drives business growth. And I'm so excited to have him today because, you know, for most of you, if you look at the demographics of social media, if you have a high ticket coaching program, you're probably going to get a lot more traction over on LinkedIn because the average uh, salary is bigger over there than on any other platform. And that's one thing when coaches go out into the world, they don't think about where are the money platforms? Is this in alignment with what I'm doing? And how can I generate more revenue? So I think that's really exciting because that is the place to be. I know personally, our own company, we're only on LinkedIn now. We do utilize social uh, YouTube and Rumble, but we do it more for our content than we do for connection and leads. So stay tuned for Anthony. I think you're really going to love this interview. Anthony, welcome to the show. Hey, Juliet. Thank you so much for having me. Thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm thrilled to have you. You guys, I, I mentioned in the intro that uh, Anthony, we have a shortage of males in our magazine. So you are <laughs> you are our male edition next year. <laughs> Outstanding. So, so how did you get to be a LinkedIn expert? Because that that always like how did how did you get into all of this? Yeah. yeah, it's not something that I went to school for or or took any traditional route uh, by by any stretch. So uh, my background, actually, I spent almost 20 years working in the non in the uh, nonprofit sector. Uh, I'll work for Ducks Unlimited in Memphis, Tennessee, where I led a digital media and marketing and online fundraising team. And a big part of what we did there was 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 manage the social media channels for the organization. Mm -hmm. And and LinkedIn was one of those channels. And back around 2018 or so. Uh, I was I was noticing that we were having more success with LinkedIn uh, from an organizational standpoint, but I really didn't know how to use it for myself. Um, and to try to get more familiar with the platform, I really just kind of just dove in mm -hmm. and and I started posting content. I started connecting with people. I, I had no strategy. I had no plan, had no idea what I was doing. Uh, but it was just one of those deals that over the long term, uh, over the course of a couple of years, I had managed to to build a network of, of 10,000 plus followers. Um, I had, uh, uh, you know, people that were reaching out to me, uh, asking for advice with LinkedIn. And then in 2020, when COVID hit and, uh, you know, a lot of people were, were losing jobs or they were worried about losing jobs, LinkedIn became really important to a lot of people really, really quick. 
And because I had been posting for such a long time and, and building a network, I found that I had people reach out to me saying, hey, will you help me with my profile? Or will you help me build a strategy? Because again, LinkedIn was becoming really important. And, and I never uh, had, a, had a business, I never had a service where I would help people with LinkedIn, but I was getting inbound leads just because they saw me as the expert. Okay. And, and that actually turned into a, a small side business for about a year or so uh, that gained enough traction that uh, in 2021, uh, it was time to either go all in or not. And so I made the leap. And so for the last three years, I've been helping both individuals and companies build their brands and grow their business on LinkedIn. That's incredible. And 2020 was such a weird year because we, right after uh, mid-March, we would get calls like, I have no digital presence from companies. And, um, you know, can you have us up in 30 days? And it's like, yeah, that's not how digital marketing works. <laughs> no. So there was a lot of, that was probably the biggest year our company ever had the busiest Um and because it, it isn't just a, here, here's a one-shot deal and, and I'm doing it. So LinkedIn became really important for us too. And our mutual friend, Scott Carson, actually, we had a little contest who could get booked for the most um, podcast guesting. So I had to learn how to reach out and, um, you know, not only, not only reciprocate, but create a lot of, a lot of new contacts as well. So you mentioned going from a corporate brand to a personal brand. And I talked to a lot of business owners who actually start out with a corporate brand and they're kind of hiding behind it. Mm -hmm. And they have to figure out how do I get out behind it? Cause I'm the rainmaker. So can you talk a little bit about how to, how to create that corporate brand and then kind of move out of the way and, and create that personal brand as well? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. And you know, historically, it, like exactly what you said, you know, it's been the corporate brand that's kind of been uh, the face of the front and center, especially on, on LinkedIn. But what I have learned uh, over the last few years is people connect with people on a much more genuine, authentic basis than they do any corporate brand. OK, even even a, a brand that you, you really love or an organization that you're passionate about, you're only going to connect with them on, on a certain level. But when they're people. Or, or when their leadership is actually, you know, uh, uh, posting content uh, through their personal profiles, it's just a lot more. Uh, it's it's a lot more natural to to connect with those individuals, and and on top of that, the LinkedIn algorithm in general really puts a lot more emphasis on the posts made by individual profiles instead of the company pages, and that's a big shift from what it was ten years ago, uh, or fifteen years ago when it was really just that job posting board, right? Like the only time I ever went to LinkedIn before, you know, 2018 was if I was hiring someone for my team, that that was it. But LinkedIn has evolved, truly evolved into a social networking platform. And, and so they want people to be social. And, and the way they do that is by putting more emphasis uh, and, and more importance on those individual profiles. So it is a big shift and a lot of people are, uh, they're not sure how to how to take that step, how to get out from behind that company page and and position themselves as a thought leader and build their personal brand. Uh, but the payoff is is it can be huge. Uh, you know, to your point earlier, it, you can't build a personal brand overnight. It, it doesn't happen. It's it's a long game. It, it is something that requires consistency and so forth. Um, and, and the day to build your personal brand isn't on the day that you need it. Uh, so as I always say, like, you know, now is a great time to start building your personal brand uh, because it can and will open up doors and new opportunities that you, you never thought possible uh, if you do it right. So there's the endorsement, everybody, from don't hide behind that corporate brand, because I think that's what we tend to do. We leave corporate America. We have that model. Oh, it works for them. But they haven't been working on it for a day either. So, you know, can you can you build them both at once or would you recommend build your personal brand and you happen to have a business, which is kind of what I do. I don't really promote the business as much as it's my personal and people know where to go for my services. Right. So if you're, a, you know, if you're an author, if you're a small business owner, something like that, it, it, focus on your profile, focus on your profile and your content. Um, you know, personally, I have a, a company page on LinkedIn. And the, re the reason I have that is just just really just, you know, if someone wants to go and see if I have a real company, they can go to that page and see it. 
but but I, I really don't post much content to it again because the algorithm doesn't really favor it and and people don't engage with it so like 95 percent of my effort on linkedin is spent through my personal profile my own posts and what i typically encourage my clients to do is if you are in that position like reshare some of your really you know some of your best performing personal posts uh, through your company page. So you still have some visibility, you still have some activity on that company page, uh, but put most of your effort through your, your personal profile. Okay, that sounds good. So I know pretty frequently, if I'm looking for someone, especially in the author space, um, I'll get somebody that gets on my calendar, I'll go look them up on LinkedIn, and I'll see that they have no image, and they have like four followers. So that's someone who's at the either very beginning or started it and abandoned it and went someplace else. How do you get started when you're first, like you're first opening up that LinkedIn account? Because my sense is people started on Facebook and then, you know, Facebook got really bad or they started on X and then they, they, they said, okay, I need to be on LinkedIn, but I have no idea because they're, they're vastly different platforms. Yeah, they, they really are. And I can give you a couple of like really, really simple starter steps for someone who is trying to figure out, you know, what to do, because LinkedIn can be very overwhelming. Uh, I think more overwhelming than most, most other social networking sites. But step number one is, is really make sure that you have your optimized, that you have your profile fully optimized, right? And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, to your point, make sure that you have a current profile picture. Make sure that that big banner image, the big background banner image, isn't blank. Because when someone hits the pro, uh, profile and they see that, for right or wrong, they immediately assume this person isn't active on LinkedIn, and there's a good chance they'll just you know close out the window and go somewhere else. So you want to make sure that it, the the profile is thoroughly filled out. You want to make sure you have things like your headline uh, that appears right below your name. For for years, people have used that as their like their job title. Like for years, my headline read uh, "Digital Marketing Director at Ducks Unlimited," but but if you are a service provider, if if you if you are trying to use your profile to to generate leads, get more clients, you want that headline to show the value proposition that you bring to clients, because you also want to look at your profile not so much through the lens of your own self, but look at it through the lens of your ideal customer. What what do what do they want to see? How can you speak to them and the problems that may they they may have in your business that you can solve? So you really want to center your profile around that as you go from top to bottom. You know, make sure you have things like the featured section turned on. Uh, the featured section allows you to highlight uh, three or more pieces of content. Uh, it could be a lead magnet. It could be a link to your online calendar. Uh, it could be recent content or posts that you've made. Um, and then moving forward or moving on down to your about section, uh, which used to be called, I think, the summary. Mm -hmm. That's really, really important because that's where you have a chance to to tell your story, to tell it in a client focused way, uh, speaking to the challenges, problems, pain points that they have, and then the solutions uh, or services that you bring to the table uh, on, on how you can help help those uh, help those ideal clients. So that's really step one: is make sure that your LinkedIn is completely filled out, uh, because uh, you, you know you get one shot to make a great first impression. You have to make it count, and that's where the profile comes in. Interesting. So we ran across something a while back where, um, and I don't know if you write these or not, but we had some people who other people had written their profiles. And it was very interesting because we went over, do you know what bank is? What's, uh, I'll say that again. Bank, uh, B-A-N-K. Yep. It's a mm. system uh, developed by Cherie Tree. And she has this wonderful uh, program within it where you can go over and you can drop some copy in and see which bank profile, each one of, each one of those letters uh, stands for a profile. And we found that most LinkedIn people who are writing LinkedIn um, profiles for other people didn't write them in the language that was their audience's language. Mm. So that was a big thing. And we started running them through bank and saying, well, you're telling me your people are action people and this is written for a nurture person. So how important is it if you hire someone to make sure that they're speaking your audience's language and not just writing this flowery, pretty stuff that describes you? 
Right. Well, you know, you, you want to make sure that those, uh, you know, if someone is is doing this for you, you're hiring them, make sure that they're asking the right questions. Like they shouldn't just say, you know, give me your your basic information. You know, they need to to dig deeper. They need to dive deeper. They need to actually request examples of your writing style, right? Uh, you know, books books you've written, emails you've written, uh, just just to understand your tone of voice. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, to, uh, yeah, to your point, you don't want it to come across as inauthentic uh, uh, or g give any hint that it was written by someone else. Uh, but I will say that with, you know, chat GPT and AI tools today, you can use those tools. I use those tools actually for a lot of my clients, mm -hmm. but you have to you have to train uh, the AI on the right the right tone of voice. Right. So yes. when I when I have a new client come on. Uh, I will feed ChatGPT all of the background information about that individual, uh, examples of their writing style, and make sure that its output is is consistent with the way that person speaks before I ever tell it to, you know, give me headline options or write an about section. So it's it's about giving it the right uh, the right background so that the um, at least the first draft that it gives you back is is close, and then from that point you obviously have to go in and fine tune and tweak and, and put your own personal spin on it. Um, but, but those tools can be incredibly helpful in, in saving you time and helping you complete that profile. I completely agree with that. We use, uh, when people take our AI, we have an AI platform building class. And that's one of the first things we do is rebuild their avatar because it has to be AI is garbage in, garbage out. When he's talking yes. about ChatGPT, you guys, you have to really have your avatar nailed. And the second thing we do is we go in and we look at that language and then you have that word. So when I put stuff in chat GP, chat GP, chat GPT, it's rewrite this and my word is sassy. And even sometimes it gets too sassy. Like a 63 year old woman should not be saying slay. So you do have to write it, you do have to adjust it, but it writes it just like that. And if you know, your audience's word, you can do, you can use ChatGPT all day long for Absolutely. What, what you're doing. And we use a lot of perplexity too, but we use that in a different way. Mm -hmm. So when you're building that personal brand, um, we start people out posting three days a week. Is that sufficient or should they be really posting more than that? And what kind of content can, would, should they be putting out there? Because I think a lot of them just write posts with no content. Like here's a picture, here's a post, but you need like substance with it. Yes, exactly. So I think uh, uh, generally speaking, two to three posts a week is is sufficient enough to, to start getting consistency and visibility without burning out. Um, and, and also, you know, two or three posts a week just feels a lot less overwhelming than thinking you have to post every day. Uh, because, you know, when you get overwhelmed, we do nothing. So start out with with two or three posts a week. And, you know, to your other question there about like what to post, the, the first and most important thing that you need to do when you when you're trying to figure out your strategy is build the foundation. And what I recommend is sit down and think about what are three or four content pillars that you can come up with. A, a pillar is just a, a topic. It's a category something that you can talk about with ease. It, it, it's something that you have a lot of expertise in and, and build three or four content pillars and then sort of brainstorm ideas of, okay, what type of posts might fall under each one of these pillars? And, and that's a good way to kind of, uh, you know, get, get, the, get, the, get the wheels turning in your mind. Uh, it gives you, it, it's not meant to box you in saying every post that you create has to fall into one of these buckets. It just gives you a framework to, to build your strategy from. Um, so once you define those pillars, you can say, okay, on, on Monday, I'm going to post about pillar one, Wednesday, I'm going to post about pillar two, Friday, pillar, pillar three, and so forth. And, and those pillars are going to be different for everyone based on, you know, their job, their industry, their, their services and so forth. Uh, but I always encourage all of my clients, your very first pillar should be a pillar about you just as a person. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, the, the old argument, you know, LinkedIn is at Facebook and, and personal content belongs on Facebook. <laughs> I, I am a big believer and, 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 I, and I built my personal brand on LinkedIn really more through the personal content than the professional content. 
um, because that type of content is highly relatable. It's it's memorable. It's it, it's just something that people connect with on, on a more genuine basis. All of your posts should not be about your family trips and 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 right. you know and 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 your kids' activities. No, that is Facebook. But sprinkling that content in, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been on a, a discovery call with a prospect. And they'll say something like, hey, I remember that post uh, about that vacation you took. You know, we, we went there last year ourselves. And and, and sometimes just, just posts like that stand out in, in someone's mind uh, because when you think about what you're trying to accomplish with your personal brand, you want to build that know, like, and trust factor. Okay. Because we do business with people we know, like, trust, and remember. Uh, so, so weaving in content that shows who you are as a human being, that shows your personality, that's going to go a very long way in helping you, you know, build that effective personal brand. Yes. And here's what you don't post. I make fun of this girl all the time, this woman. Um, she used to post, she was in real estate and she used to post like her child custody or divorce drama. <laughs> no. And I like, if you want to do that on Facebook, great. But if you do it on LinkedIn, I am seriously going to wonder if you have time to show me houses and service yeah, exactly. all that drama you got going on. <laughs> And, and that brings up a great distinction. There's personal content and there's private content. And, you know, the personal is kind of what I describe, what you just described. That's that should be more private. Right. The private stuff doesn't belong on LinkedIn. Uh, so important distinction to make there. The private stuff should remain private, period. Don't even exactly put it on, <laughs> put it on Facebook. It doesn't that's the kind of stuff that just just kills you. But so we're talking about I mean, yes, you talked about vacation. You talked a little bit about kids maybe about, you know, I don't want to say case studies, but like for me in my bio, I share that I'm an avid golfer and, you know, Taekwondo mm -hmm. and things like that. That would be appropriate to share. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Except if you saw my golf score, you'd say no. It's <laughs> completely it's better than mine. Juliet. Uh, as much as you golf, it should be better than that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, back to the content. Mm -hmm. uh, you also, and this is where I think I really see people fall down, is watch your analytics, because that's going to give you some clues within those pillars about what people are really responding to and what they're not, right? And you want to do more of what they're responding to. Absolutely. You, you, you want to pay close attention to the analytics, um, and because that data will help guide you as to what type of content you need to you know, either lean into or, or back away from. My, my other recommendation there with, with content as you're building your pillars, think about how you can be a, 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 a person of value on LinkedIn, okay? Because if you think about the, the traditional, uh, stereotypical, you know, LinkedIn user, it's someone who's, you know, throwing cold sales pitches and DMs and self-promoting and, you know, look, I just got a new job or I just got a promotion and, and that's all they ever post about. You want to take a position of figuring out what some of your customer pain points are, what are, what are the challenges, what solutions do you bring to the industry, and and talk about those. And, and not in a salesy, uh, self-promotional way, but like solve problems through your content. And, you know, just as an example, a, a huge part of my content that I put out on a, on a weekly basis on LinkedIn is the how-to, the tips, the tactics how to optimize your, your personal, you know, your, your profile, how to build a content strategy, how to, how to repurpose content, you know, things that people can take and actually use. Um, and, and what that does is a couple of things. One, it builds up your expertise in their mind, right? Uh, they're not going to be able to take everything that you've given them and go do all of the things on their own, but it's going to build trust. Uh, it's going to help you establish credibility and it, it keeps you top of mind so that when they do need your product or your service, you're going to be the one that they think about as opposed to their competitor, right? So, so be a person of value. And the, the other piece of advice there, build relationships on LinkedIn. It, it's not just about your content. And, and if, you, if you take that approach, you will fail. You want to make sure that you are building relationships by, by commenting on other posts every day. Uh, in fact, the algorithm right now is putting more more favorability and 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 rewarding you in a big way if you are contributing to the larger part of the conversation, leaving comments on a regular basis. Not just comments that say great post or I agree, but actual 
meaningful comments that add value to someone else's uh, conversation. That is just as important, if not more important, than your own uh, than your own content. And I always tell my clients when they're first starting out, after they get that profile uh, completely filled out, before you even start posting your own content, go into the comments. Like find uh, find conversations relevant to your industry. Uh, whether that's prospects, whether it's your peers, uh, competitors, whatever, in, uh, find ways to inject yourself into those conversations because if you're doing that in a meaningful way, what's going to happen? They're going to come to your profile. If someone leave, if, if a complete stranger leaves a comment on your post and it's good, what are you going to do? You, you go check out their profile. So it's a great way to get visibility, uh, sometimes massive visibility, without even posting your own content. And, and as you do that, it will give you, it will start to give you ideas for your own content. So that's always a great like second, uh, you know, second uh, piece of the puzzle before you even jump into your own content. Okay. So if someone is a little more advanced, can you talk about like lives and newsletters and all that as well? Because those are kind of that once you get it set up and you feel comfortable, now move into those bigger things that I feel really help with the relationships and the comments too. Sure. So for, for the ones who are more advanced, um, my, my number one recommendation right now is lean into video. Uh, video content is, is so impactful and so important for so many reasons. One of which is, you know, there's a lot of AI generated crap in the newsfeed. And you're seeing it more and more people who, who use it to create content and they copy and paste it. And, and it just screams, Hey, this is, inauthentic, you know, uh, content. There's a lot of noise in the newsfeed. So video really helps you stand out and cut through that clutter. Mm -hmm. On top of that, it also helps you establish, rela uh, establish relationships uh, a lot better. People connect again with people. And when someone can see your face and hear your voice and, and get an idea of your personality, again, that keeps you memorable. And, and, and video is really the fastest way to build your personal brand uh, it's the toughest for for many people because they're uh, camera shy or they're 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 lack the confidence to get you know to get started. But I certainly encourage you one to lean into video, and then two of those other things that you you talked about. Uh, if you really want to take video to the next step, LinkedIn live streams are phenomenal right now. Uh, they are it's it's like taking video but bringing in a live discussion you know as, as part of that. Um, and, and I think one of the easiest ways to get started with live streams is instead of just going on by yourself uh, and, and talking on a, a topic, like bring someone else on, someone in your, in your industry. It could be a, a client, a, a customer, a, a, someone that you've collaborated with and, and hold a 30 minute live stream session where you're talking about a particular um, uh, topic that's of interest to your target market. And what you'll find as you do several of these, uh, the engagement is typically really high, uh, you, especially if you're inviting the audience to ask questions. It, it makes them feel part of that conversation uh, in, in a way that you really just don't get over Zoom. And the other benefit of having that, that live stream is once it's over, uh, it, it lives on your profile indefinitely. So people can go back and watch it. They can discover it you know, weeks, months after you've created it. Uh, so it, it has a really long lifespan. Um, and then on top of that, you can actually take that live stream and chop it up into small clips and repurpose that for individual posts that you can make, you know, weeks after the event. So, so many different benefits to, to video and to live stream. Uh, but the folks who can lean into that right now and take advantage of those are going to, to do really well on LinkedIn. Do you still need, so I've, I've been, I haven't done lives in a while, but I've, I've, when I first got on, we had to get approved for live because it was brand new. Do you still have to get approved? And then um, will they just let you go live or do you need still StreamYard or one of those other, I'm trying to think of the name of the one we we used. It wasn't StreamYard. Um, do you have to use a third-party app still? Good question, yeah. So in the past, you did have to get uh, approval uh, and, and that was a bit of a process. They did away with that. And uh, up until maybe six months ago, the live stream option was built into what they call creator mode. 
mm-hmm. uh, which which they have now done away with. So the the short answer, I think, to your question is, I believe that they've done away with all of those restrictions. I believe now anyone who has a uh, an account with at least a hundred or two hundred followers or more, I think that's sort of the only restriction. Um, so they've made it a lot easier for the general public to use that service. Uh, and then to your second question, yes, going live on LinkedIn is not as simple as doing a Facebook live where you just you know hit live and you're you're there. You do have to use a, a third party streaming service, um, s- services like Streamyard, Restream. That's right, Restream yeah. is the one that 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 I have used and I use with most of my clients. Uh, seem to have good success with that. It is another add-on and it is a, uh, you know, it's like 20 bucks a month to have that. Uh, but it is a, a necessary piece of software if you want to go live on, link, on LinkedIn. Yeah. And the other thing too, is when you use Restream, I haven't used uh, StreamYard. You can also go live on YouTube at the same time. So you're, you're very, you're, a, you're all over the place. So talk about, let's talk about the shorts real quick, because you can use something like Opus, take your stream, run it through and get shorts to lead back to that as well. So that's another way to get more eyes. You were talking about they can find it, um, you know, two, three, four months, a year down the line is running a short and putting that link to that post in there. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I love Opus Clips, the tool that you just mentioned for those who don't know. I think it's opusclips.com. You can drop a you know a really long video, thirty minute hour video, and it does a really good job of using AI to identify some of those you know short clips, thirty seconds to thirty to ninety seconds that would that would serve as a great post to repurpose uh, on your profile later on. Um, most of my clients, when we do our live streams, I will take that. Uh, we will we will run it through Opus. We'll identify, you know, eight to 10 posts that we can use, video posts, reschedule that into their LinkedIn, but then also upload it as a YouTube short, as a TikTok um, on Instagram, if if they're on those channels. So that's really the other tip there is, you know, you can take that video content and repurpose it across multiple channels in in, in a much more effective way than you could, say, a text post, right? So that's, that's just another reason why I love video and why I love, love live streams you can get a lot of mileage out of a single 30 minute or, or one hour recording. You can. And we're actually on Rumble now too. We're, we're actually doing better, I think, on Rumble than we than we are on YouTube. Um, there's just different monetization criteria. So we're, I mean, we've been on two weeks and we've, we're already monetized over there versus oh, wow. all of the YouTube that has to go on. But the other thing I love about Opus is that it gives you a grade. It tells you and it picks sound bites. So as an author, if you're going to be on media, you need to understand how to get on an interview and grab sound bites, have sound bites ready. Because I've noticed when you have a media savvy person on and you're doing, you know, those live streams, if there's somebody who's used to speaking in sound bites, you're going to get great opus clips because that's they've already learned how to put the, all that together. So what about the LinkedIn newsletter? That is probably my favorite thing because I think I have about 3,000 subscribers and I didn't do a darn thing to get them. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Newsletters uh, can be a fantastic tool uh, for sure. I always recommend that if you're just getting started, you know, focus on your posts, focus on building up your network first. And then once you become a, a bit established, then uh, starting a newsletter makes sense, uh, especially if you if you can pick a a um, a topic, if you can pick a cadence that you can stick to, whether that's weekly or monthly, just something that you know that you will be able to to to, to stick to. In the past, LinkedIn newsletters were were called the Pulse or, or articles uh, that were basically just one off articles. They were long form content as opposed to short term uh, short form uh, text posts. Uh, long form content that you can embed multimedia, videos, images, sort of like a blog, basically. Mm-hmm. And and that's exactly what you can do within the newsletter. What's really great about the newsletter, and probably one of the reasons that you got 3,000 subscribers, is because when you launch your first newsletter, LinkedIn will automatically send a notification to all of your contacts saying, uh, you know, Juliet has 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 launched this, this uh, uh, newsletter. Would you like to subscribe? And, and, and if it's a good topic, especially if that first letter 
newsletter is strong, which it needs to be for this very reason, you'll get a large percentage of your followers to automatically subscribe. Uh, so, so that's a big win. The other part of that is every time you write a newsletter, because it is a newsletter, it gets sent via email to that person's inbox. Uh, unlike your posts, which on any given day, the algorithm is going to decide if, if you're going to see that post or not, you're going to guarantee that that post is at least going to end up in your inbox, making it more likely the, that the people who subscribe to it are going to get to see it. So those are just some of the big benefits and, and the reasons why I love those uh, LinkedIn newsletters. I do too. And we post our podcast once a week there. So, you know, here's the link and we tell them what's about, but we also put our events in. And since we started doing that and it's dropping into boxes, we have more and more people showing up for those free trainings too. So there's, you can use it in multiple ways, I, I think on there. Okay. Let's get to the big ugly elephant on LinkedIn. And I hate this when people drop into my inbox and try to sell me something and it's like, who the hell are you? And <laughs> I, why makes you think I want this? And why are you so obnoxious? I don't use LinkedIn to sell at all. It's content, learn, train. You, you will never find me selling something on there unless I'm completely desperate, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, 100%. So well, I like to call that pitch slapping. And, and that's that's what most people do. Do you know they, I, hold on, hold on. Did you know I wrote a book called Pitch Slapped? No. <laughs> yes, in 2020, I released a book and the title was Pitch Slapped. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we're on the same page there. I, that's I love that phrase because that's that's what it is. And and you know, that tactic might have had some success 15 years ago. But but to your point, everyone's inboxes are completely full of spam, of, of cold sales pitches that, that just get ignored. Um, on, on top of that, you have a lot of people who pay for automation. So, you know, they're sending out not just, you know, sending it themselves. They're using a service to spam hundreds or thousands of people in, in, in any given week. Um, so for that reason, you know, a lot of people have just been turned off by the DMs in general on, on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, I don't use uh, DMs to sell. I use them to build relationships. Yeah. Um, so if someone, you know, if someone connects with me, if someone leaves a, a really meaningful comment uh, on my post, I may go into the DMs and, and, and leave a voice note or something like that. Just thanking them, just, just acknowledging them. That's a great way to stand out from all the other people who are, you know, just pitching and selling in the DMs and, 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 I'm not a salesman. I've never been trained in sales. I have a marketing and, and, and a technical background. Um, I, I, I stink at sales, but I always say I, I sell through my personal brand. Mm -hmm. I sell through the reputation and through the content that I've established on LinkedIn. And, and, and because of that, I rely, I, I'm able to have most of my business come as inbound leads, people who already you know, know, like, and trust me to some degree um, and, and, and that means I don't have to do that outreach that that's never going to work. So that's really the approach. If you want to be successful on LinkedIn, start focusing on your personal brand, being a person of value, building those relationships, that's going to pay off, uh, many, many times over than any cold sales pitch that you could drop. That's so true. And I will tell you guys in all the time I've been on LinkedIn, I just set my first appointment from a DM but it was because I already knew the guy from real estate 20 years ago and I saw he was doing something else. So I think it'll be more of a catch up call than a, you know, I, he's going to try to sell me something call. <laughs> right. So, exactly. You know, it can be that, things like that too. So you mentioned something there and I know we're running kind of long here, but um, you mentioned something about automation. It's my understanding that LinkedIn hates automation. And if your automation gets out of control, you're going to lose your entire account, contacts, everything. So I quit. I used to use Octopus CRM. I don't use it anymore. Everything I do is organic. What are your, what do you know about that? Is that, I don't want to down anybody's business out there that, that does automation, but I don't think that LinkedIn is on board with it. Is no, my not, uh, automation is very clearly against their terms of service. And it has really shocked me that they have allowed so many uh, companies to, to still do that. 
Um, they are cracking down on it because, you know, as we mentioned earlier, it turns the user base off. It makes people hate LinkedIn because it's just filled with those robotic sales pitches. Um, so yeah, huge, you know, huge recommendation for me. It's not worth the risk. Uh, I will tell you that a couple a year, it was a lot last year, I had a client that I was working with, uh, you know, helping him build his personal brand, write content and so forth. And uh, he got a sales call from one of these automation services, decided he was going to invest in that uh, against my recommendations. And within a few months, his his account was deactivated. Oh, wow. That's the risk that you that you run by, by trying to take that shortcut. Uh, it's just not worth it uh, in the long run. Okay, great. So you guys will be able to find Anthony in the magazine, but if we don't want to wait till 2025, where can we find you now? <laughs> yeah. So a couple of places besides LinkedIn, uh, find me at anthonyjonesconsulting.com. Uh, but also uh, I just recently launched a new online membership community called the Brandwagon community. And you can find that at brandwagonclub.com. Uh, it's filled with all the tools, coaching and resources uh, that you need to build your 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 brand or your business on LinkedIn without the high price uh, cost of of one to one coaching. So, uh, brandwagonclub.com is, is is certainly a membership to check out. Okay, put that down here to make sure it gets in the note. Brandwagon.com. Brandwagonclub.com. Uh, okay, Anthony, thank you so much for that was a lot of information today. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. All right, we'll talk soon.